I'm Nikki Jumpy from Look Up Strata, and in this video, we're chatting about a couple who challenged the smoke drift exposure they were experiencing in their small New South Wales strata scheme. Brenton Pittman and Lynette Cartwright successfully and eventually won in a final hearing to stop their downstairs neighbour from smoking on their balcony or allowing smoke to drift into their apartment. As you can imagine, there were lots of ups and downs during the long drawn out process. Brenton joins us today to discuss why they took action, what worked and what they've learned from the experience. We're also joined by Karen Stiles from the Owners Corporation Network. Brenton, welcome and thanks for joining us today to speak about your experiences. Can you give us some background about the building and why you chose to take action that has essentially taken over the last few years of your life? And if you could step us through the process, that would be great. Uh, so when we retired we, in 2013, uh, we started looking extensively around New South Wales and Queensland for a place to retire. And we happened to come into Kingscliff in 2016 after a recommendation from a friend. So we uh, then realised every bell was ringing positive. Um, great looking shops, beach, uh, new unit off the plan, uh, um, uh, reasonably quiet. Um, golf club, bowling club, airport, hospital, everything sort of fit for, fit for good purpose for us. So that's why we, after probably looking at 50, 60 different locations up the coast and around, um, we selected every bell rung for Kingsley. So we, it was a difficult build. The builder went into liquidation um, a few months after we moved in. So much of the repair work had to be left to the owners. When you've got that type of problem as well, it does cause anxiety for many people, uh, which it did here and just with the work uh, going on. We hadn't lived in strata previously. Um, we had standalone houses uh, without any issue. Um, uh, didn't know what a thing called a strata bylaw was until we sort of saw it in our contract. Um, and the I guess the relevance of that uh, but we learned pretty quickly uh, what things should be there and shouldn't be there we realized we had two major gaps one being smoking and one being Airbnb both of those have now been adjusted into our strata bylaws and we've now added four or five different different things into our bylaws from what were the model bylaws from 2015 prior to October 2016. So they were the old bylaws, new bylaws came in, model bylaws came in in October 2016. We were still operating with the old bylaws. In 2020, we recognised a smoking issue from some tenants, and that was the first time that we raised it with the Strata Committee and the Owners Corporation to consider having a bylaw for some type of smoke drift control. Um, uh, so we've raised that three or four times and it was only after this matter had been completed that the Owners Corporation finally agreed through a special resolution to have the strata bylaw brought in, but that didn't come in until October 2022. So we had tenants below us that were smokers um, uh, prior to June 2021 and we negotiated successfully with them about them having uh, uh, being able to smoke on their balcony at certain times during the week, which we would then be aware of, and we relocate ourselves elsewhere. That worked extremely well. Um, and according to them, they'd heard nothing more from us once that negotiation was made. New owners moved in in uh, May or June 2021, the respondents, and uh, we found out very early that they were both smokers. Um, we uh, went away for that first month they were here at Travelling. Uh, when we returned after a week or so, we found that uh, the smoke was getting quite unbearable. We had had interaction with both of them previously, and we thought it was probably best to have documentary evidence of all our approaches to the new owners. And as such, we, uh, we sent the first of three polite and respectful emails outlining the smoke drift we were getting, when we were getting it, what it was doing to us, and the changes we had to make to our lifestyle to accommodate their smoke drift that was entering our balcony and 
into the any air vents we had even when our doors and windows were closed. So we sent three very polite and respectful emails. Nothing came of that except for the third email at the end of it says that they didn't want any more email exchanges uh, on the smoke drift matter. We then organized a facilitated meeting with the strata manager for the five of us, the strata manager and uh, the two respondents and us two um, across the park to address the matter. Uh, and unfortunately, there was no resolution that was viable to us. Uh, the only thing that came out of it was that, you know, an air purifier may do the job to help us out. So we left that meeting knowing that there was, uh, after outlining what the numbers were of number of smoke drifts we we're getting, which were around about 70 a week, uh, smoke drift continued. So we then brought everyone else in the building into the fray by going to the owners corporation, asking for them to issue a notice to comply under the Charter Management Act 2015, item number 153, to not cause a nuisance or a hazard. The other owners in the complex were totally against such and as such, it did go to a vote and was uh, voted down, wasn't passed five to one, with those votes also carrying comments that because they couldn't smell it on the non-leeward side of the building, and those that were below our outer tube, because we're on the top floor, um, uh, they couldn't sell the smoke, so it didn't exist because they couldn't smell it. So we had comments like that, and we could see there was just going to be a fracture there, which was already a pretty tough environment anyway. That got voted down. Uh, so we then were still daily and nightly uh, receiving cigarette smoke drift in every room uh, in the east part of our unit and on our balcony, which we could no longer use. Um, we then approached the community justice centre uh, who, are, uh, who sent out three letters asking for um, an opportunity for mediation and all three offers were rejected by the respondents. We then contacted NCAT who have a system of mediation and adjudication and at the mediation part of it uh, we tried to mediate just asking for one thing total and permanent elimination of cigarette smoke drift from their lot into our lot and the response to that was well that's not going to happen this started in june and here we are in about uh, october and november we then set up a meeting with ncat for the adjudication part of it the first uh, um, tribunal member wasn't available. We found out a couple of weeks before the hearing date, so it had to be postponed until the middle of December. Um, and we finally did have a provided our evidence. No one was represented by solicitors at this time, uh, provided our evidence, and that was received, but there was no oral hearing or no further debate at that hearing. It was just a matter of the evidence that had been provided by both parties. And the tribunal member uh, adjudicated on that and within four or five hours of that day came out with his two page decision, which was uh, that smoke drift wasn't permitted from their lot into our lot and that was to stop. Um, and all doors and windows to remain closed within 10 minutes of, um, of any smoking within their complex. The, decision was only two pages and it looked like it was too brief for everyone's liking including ours and didn't have a great deal of substance of saying why they come to that decision and it was appealed by the respondents um, and that appeal took some while with new evidence having to be provided at that appeal it was decided that the original decision was quashed and that a new hearing was to be organised and new evidence could be submitted and it could be oral presentation. We then uh, employed a solicitor because it was getting too hard for us to go through the legal part of it. And then we had a third hearing in June that took a complete day 
and the tribunal member then spent 14 weeks uh, making their decision, 36 pages or something like that um, uh, summary uh, in our favour that smoke drift had to stop and uh, no smoke drift was permitted to be from their lot into our lot and they weren't able to smoke on the balcony, their friends weren't allowed to smoke on the balcony. And if they're smoking indoors, all windows and doors needed to be closed. Um, so there's no smoke drift whatsoever. Uh, that came down in October, but we were still unfortunately receiving smoke drift until January or February. Um, we got our solicitor involved again without going to back to NCAT and just put a warning there that we are still receiving smoke drift and itemised what it was. The smoke drift issues have uh, have stopped for the time being since February. Karen, thanks so much for joining us today. How do you feel about the process Brent and, and Lynette had to go through in order to arrive at the final decision? From OCN's perspective, the strata dispute resolution system is broken uh, and we're very keen to talk to the new uh, Attorney General about... Um, working on the, the NCAT uh, process. Um, the NCAT website says that NCAT provides a simple, quick and effective process for resolving disputes. And it goes on to say NCAT's appeal panel provides a timely and cost-effective mechanism to enable prompt reviews of most tribunal decisions. But um, as Brenton has outlined, the facts of the case are that they started the process in June 2021, and it was not resolved until 11 October 2022. Um, and we have many members who have been going to the tribunal for up to seven years trying to get resolution of particularly water ingress into their apartments. So, you know, it was a complicated process. You know, you had it attempts to stop the smoke drift included a facilitated meeting by the strata manager, a, a notice to comply, three requests from community justice to um, attend mediation, a mediation attempt by NCAT, and then the prolonged process of it, the NCAT adjudication process. Um, obviously, on a personal level, it's about an enormous amount of time and energy and legal fees. So Brenton, you've just heard Karen speak about the tribunal, um, a single quick and effective process. Do you agree with that after going through all of this over the last few years? Uh, no, I don't agree with it, but I thought that we may have just lucked out each time. Uh, and, and each time we were doing something, we found that we were on the poor end of it, whether it be a tribunal member missing in action and then having to defer whether it be an appeals panel tribunal member saying that we needed to prove that passive smoke drift was a health hazard. I think we dealt with nine different parties uh, at NCAT on the, on the court side of it, not to mention dealing with the uh, front office call centre, but uh, we just put it down to it couldn't be working like this all the time. Um, so for our situation, no, it was a very difficult uh, process and only because of our resilience and our persistence were we successful to get to an end from NCAT. I believe the majority of people I know and who have told me they would have given up within weeks or months. So do you feel, Karen, that it's an unusual situation or have you seen this type of thing over and over again with your members? We get lots of reports of people just ground down by the process. We've got members who have spent over $100,000 on legal representation on what should be a very simple, quick and just process. So no, the system is definitely broken. And is there any other recourse if people are having similar problems to Brenton from whether it be a defect point of view or water ingress or smoking? Is there any avenue to go through NCAT? That's the process really. And then the enforcement of orders is also a problem. You need to go to the local court for that. So it is a very convoluted situation. That's why OCN's been calling for a strata commissioner with education and adjudication powers and a standing law committee that would be reviewing laws 
on a con continual basis rather than the humongous five-year reviews and all that pain in between. So we're pretty focused on that and was talking to all of the parties about that before the recent New South Wales election. I think Bretton's done a beautiful job of, of outlining the difficulty um, of this, the protected nature of the dispute. And I think also strata committees need to become more active in the management of their buildings. Um, there should have been proactive uh, committee in this case. It's not good enough to say, I can't smell it, therefore it's not a problem. You know, there is a, a duty of care that's owed to all of the owners. And there's ample evidence going back decades of the harms of secondhand smoke. So again, why NCAT was looking for evidence and, and took so long to decide such a, a clear matter is, is beyond me. Can you explain to us what impact your owners corporation had on the process and eventual outcome? There was a recent case in Queensland when one resident took another resident to the commissioner's office and sought orders to stop them from smoking on their balcony. In this instance, the body corporate refused to get involved. Could your committee have been more proactive? Uh, my experience now with strata is that many of us are untrained in star, strata regulation and legislation and bylaws and what the government and the local government provide. Um, many people find it as a social club rather than an organisation that is there to protect and promote the investment of the property, you know, uh, whether it's through maintenance, through cleanliness, through health. We are not alone. You know, we've got many friends along this strip who've got significant issues when it comes to advocacy for each other rather than independent uh, judgment for what is right and wrong. Your record keeping is described as meticulous evidence and compelling. How much effort was this and how did you know to keep such detailed records? Just through my previous business um, uh, dealings. I was always keeping records for my company, uh, 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 which may be used in court at times. So it just came to noting a date, a time, what was said and all that sort of stuff. So what we did far after we realised this was a, setting out a problem, we would then write a diary out every single day. So with that, uh, we'd start the we'd start the day and the the date, what direction the wind was going. Now that was quite important because one of the excuses was, oh, we've got so much wind here, it blows the smoke away. Well, what we proved that we're on the leeward side, and more than sixty percent of the wind is blowing from the south, and we're on the north side, and we're up. So it's quite reasonable that we'd be the only people getting smoke trip. So we put that into evidence there of what the direction was. If one or both of us smoke, cigarette smoke, we would then record the time of the day, what part of the unit we're in, uh, any other activity that may have happened, if we could hear a dog barking at the time below or noises scraping chairs or something like that. And more importantly, what it was doing to us, distracting us, giving us a bad smell, bad taste in our mouth, irritated eyes, uh, sore throat, whatever it may have been, uh, lack of concentration. And we just write that down. I also, I lost my job out of it because I couldn't concentrate. So it turned out that over 200 days of doing this, we had 800 events. So we just put it into a spreadsheet for them, uh, for, the, for the court to have a look at. The, from our diaries onto a spreadsheet, a, a Word document, which six or eight of them were disputed. So when you've got one percent just disputed, a, a tribunal member is going to say, well, 99% of this is pretty accurate. How much weight do you feel that actually had in your success of the case, ultimately? Immense. Even though it wasn't brought out in the uh, matter constantly, he made two or three comments that it was probably the the best record keeping he'd seen for every one of his cigarette smoke cases that had ever been published. Um, so um, I believe it was highly important and special when you've got something so substantial. You know, if it's if it was only three or four smoke drift events in a week, you're not really talking about when you've got 800 over 200 days of constant um, unrelenting smoke drift. 
uh, I believe, very important. I can imagine the amount of time any all of this took for you to keep on top of it all um, and keep it all in order. And um, I think it's also important to mention to people that are going through not so much even as an issue with smoking, but with noise or piano playing or rubbish coming onto their balcony or any, any nuisance that they're finding if they keep the records of when that's happening, uh, regardless of what that, that nuisance is, then that would all build their case and make it a lot easier when they actually take it to a tribunal situation. Correct, yes, yes. Yeah. In the case we've spoken about in Queensland, they were successful because they tackled the smoke drift as a hazard rather than a nuisance. Was this part of your case? And if so, how? Nikki, we were successful in both hazard and nuisance. And in the second case in New South Wales to be successful in both. Uh, I think Grist was the first one and this one quite substantial where the nuisance was defined because of um, the uh, nuisance being substantial and unreasonable interference. 800 events of this over 200 days is unreasonable, uh, uh, substantial and an interference to us for what it was doing. So on the nuisance, most certainly, and then on the hazard, what we did with the hazard, uh, for the health hazard, we went, it's not very hard to Google what smoke, passive smoke damage is doing to people and how far you can smell it. So we, we found research from Canada and Scotland showing that one cigarette lit up at one time can travel nine meters. So we, we came up with that. And that was just one singer. What we're saying is we've got two respondents who are having a nice little cigarette and drink time down below. And it's not confined just to one cigarette, possibly. It may be confined to two or three each in a session. So the nuisance side uh, was substantiated and the ha hazard we spent a great deal of time on the health hazard. The Cancer Council were very proactive to us um, and they, at the end of it, were very keen to know what the outcome is and published a brochure. How important is the smoking bylaw? How would the situation have been different if there was a smoking bylaw in place in your scheme from the very beginning? We would have negotiated with the owners' corporation in a manner that was escalating any time that we got a rejection. So if it meant then taking the owner's corporation to NCAT, if they're not going to do something, we would have done that. Yeah, so it was a matter of the, either the owner and that we can do that under section 241 of the Strata Scheme Management Act, or the owner's corporation, if they've got a responsibility for the for the strata bylaws and they didn't act on it, we would have enforced that. Could other options have been explored? Were any alternative solutions considered? We did consider alternatives with the previous tenants and it worked out quite well. On the Tuesdays and Thursday nights, we know they're going to have a puff. They put a fan up, they put an umbrella up, and we knew just to be down in the back of the house. So it's not that we were not trying to find a solution here. Will this spill over into other areas of strata? Will it affect barbecues on, no. on balconies? It's unlikely because barbecues are not substantial. They're not unreasonable interference. I mean, someone may light up their barbecue three times a week and it goes for an hour and a half. This is not substantial and unreasonable. So on the nuisance side of it, it probably doesn't pass the pub test there. And the second side of it on the health issue, it probably doesn't pass either because it's not a health hazard. You know, uh, so, uh, and people then saying spicy food cooking and all that sort of stuff. Again, same thing, happening uh, several times a week, not constantly. And so it's not substantial, it's not unreasonable, and it's not interference. Now, this comes back to Section 153 of the Act, owners, occupiers and other persons not to create a nuisance. I imagine there are smokers out there who are quite angry about this situation. I know we've received comments on articles were shared expressing concerns. Smokers may feel that they're being controlled within their own property and then they should be able to do what they want inside their own space. So what do you say to this? But they're not using their own space, though. They're, they're not capturing that cigarette smoke. If I've got no issue 
with people smoking really. I've never had a great issue with it. I just don't want their smoke drift in my face. So they can do whatever they want on their balcony, but it doesn't need to be shared. As soon as that smoke leaves their balcony, it's on common property and can affect anyone who's above them on the leeward side or possibly below. How important was it to stay focused and non-emotional during the process, Brenton? Look, we decided pretty early on just to stay focused on the problem. Don't worry about the noise. Don't worry about the emotion. Don't worry. Don't respond to the negativity that's happening around here. Just stay focused on permanent elimination of smoke drift. So everything we've got is that. We've not commented on anything that has uh, in writing that has the noise around there. Very important. And obviously making sure you're doing the right thing in your own strata community. So don't be the person in your building that's parking in visitor parking and has three pets in the in the unit without letting anybody else know, but then at the same time be complaining about the person downstairs that's smoking. That's right, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. That's right. You have to, you, you, your shed has to be clean before you can start complaining about someone else's shed. Okay. You need to be enough. good strata citizens. Exactly, yes. And um, and Karen, that's not very difficult. I mean, to just it's respect. So, was it worth it, Brenton? I hope it's worth it for what you and I are doing now. At the end of it, what we paid is just astronomical and it is outside the realm of the majority of people. Uh, has it been worth it? No. Everyone, no one here is, is friends with us. We're still ostracized by most people. Um, the only thing I now want out of this is uh, we think we can get some value, some legacy out of movement to stop cigarette smoke drift on balconies because it does not work. Individual people trying to fight the issue would not have the administrative and the financial resources and the resilience that both Lynette and I have. You know, they may have two of those things, but not necessarily three. Mm. And that's a hard thing in strata, isn't it? You're in a dispute, but you're actually in a dispute with the person that you're seeing in the hallway and in the lift and in the car park, especially in a small strata scheme as well. Uh, six lots, is that what you're in? Six lots, yes. Six yeah. lots. I mean, that's a small, a small scheme. Um, so you're running into those people, I'd imagine, quite frequently around the building. Um, did you have anything to add to that, Karen, at all? Or? No, just huge congratulations for sticking through it. And... You're right, you have made a difference for a lot of people. So that's a huge legacy, Brenton and Lynette. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance, defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.